Thank you for coming. Um, I think what Will said is kind of really important, and I want to try and talk today about the kind of provenance of the work, so the being involved with the AA and how, what that led to, to me as an architect, and how important it is, I think, for you as students to kind of do interesting work at school and realize that it's something that can feed what you do afterwards. Um, what I call what we do is local adaptation. And in nature, this has existed, obviously, for millions of years. In architecture, it's existed when you think of vernacular architecture. Um, it's a way of kind of thinking about a place where you very carefully analyze it and very carefully understand what, what it is about that place that's unique and how you can respond to it. Um, this interest in sunlight, I think, probably started at EA, but maybe started as a child. So I grew up, I was born in Italy, moved to Brazil, then Mexico, then abruptly back to England when I was about five. And I think then with kind of holidays abroad, I was always kind of interested in sun and what it did and how it felt, especially to experience it and what it was like to live with it. Um, so I think within architecture, there's lots of examples of a very solar responsive architecture. This is a shot of Marrakesh in the um, Architecture Without Architects book, where you know very simple things are happening. You have extremely narrow pathways between buildings and large courtyards that are held, uh, don't overlook these streets. And basically all the buildings are sharing three sides with other buildings and exposing themselves to the sun as little as possible. So this is a strategy that was developed over centuries for keeping a space cool, keeping a house cool, creating privacy and dealing with all sorts of other cultural issues at the same time. So when you look at what I call cultural opacity in our work, this is in Washington, everybody's hiding from the sun. This is in London, everybody's in the sun. It's a very kind of simple distinction, but it's very important when you're trying to work in different climates and understand what these differences are and why they matter. So I'm just going to talk briefly about the project I did at the AA with John and Julia uh, Fraser. And this was a kind of you know, really big change in my life going to the AA. So I had worked, I did originally studied interior design at Kingston and then worked for eight years and went to the AA and luckily fell upon this unit that was doing something quite extraordinary. But I, I think I can actually quite clearly say I didn't understand anything I was doing for the two years I was there. And it's taken a long time to understand it. But what I did do in my fifth year was a computer program which now seems relatively uh, common to do. But 25 years ago, this was not an easy task. So I was writing this in Autolisp and AutoCAD. And I, again, was having to learn it from scratch and understand very, very kind of fundamental things that each command made. So that page there is my diploma project. And it was presented live as a computer script that ran. And there were no drawings and there were no buildings, which is also a kind of fundamental part of it. Where it started from was a very simple basis of looking at a single point in space and understanding the differences on this planet between these points in space and what they generate, how they hit the ground. And this was a, then the kind of starting point that was always the same starting point, but again in a different latitude and again understanding the differences. And then this got started to get more complex and is generating form and organization based purely on solar criteria, so nothing else affecting this. So when I left the AA, I was lucky enough to set up my own practice straight away and had a first project called Lighthouse. Um, and it was on a backland backland site in Notting Hill, hidden away, surrounded by five-story buildings here, five-story buildings here, and a big church on the corner. Um, hidden down a access of a street. So it was a kind of typical backland site uh, with these high 
high walls around it on four sides. What I really wanted to do is get away from how I'd worked previously. I wanted to start off without any preconceived ideas about what I was going to do. I wanted to really analyze the site, and I really wanted to get to know it. This, in fact, took us six months to do what we ended up doing, which was developing a way of uh, breaking down the information about the site and the environmental conditions there. So starting with sunlight, these were the kind of first tests we did in radiance at the ground plane, and this is a kind of typical annual year's uh, map of sun hours, which tells you some things. It tells you this isn't very sunny and this is starting to get sunny. It starts to give you a bit of shape about the space. But when you start to break down that information, this is actually six meters up, you realize that in winter, there's absolutely no sun, or very, very little sun, you know, 30 hours a year here. So my client spent an awful lot of money on a plot of land, and he's not going to get any sun. And in our culture, we want sun. I think it's a really fundamental thing we need and want. So you start breaking the information down to the different seasons. Um, but even that doesn't really help determine what you could do with it. So we started breaking it down even more. And we created 6,000 uh, equally spaced isospatial um, points in space. And each one of those would analyze and had a set of criteria attached to them. We could then um, search through those criteria, different criteria we would set and understand differences. So this is um, different times of year and different heights in the, in, the, in the site. And what we were looking for was kind of volumes of space that had a certain criteria. So if you think of a garden in this country, you want a sunny space all year round if you can. If you think of a study, you might want something a bit more calm. If you think of the kitchen, you might want it very uh, full of light in the morning and a living room, maybe it's evening. So the kind of criteria you're setting start to determine what you're searching for. So simple things we start to look at. This is the most sun hours. Um, this is the summer. No, this is all year most sun hours. And this is the lowest, lowest sun hours. So this, this one ended up becoming where we put the main garden, up in the air, kind of five meters up in the air, two thirds of the way towards the end of the site. We put all the bedrooms downstairs because the client decided they were happy with that, being dark. And then this was a kind of critical one where we found where is there sunlight all year round, which sounds like a kind of obvious question, but what it means is in winter there's sun here. If you remember those maps I showed, there was no sun here, no sun here, but actually there is a little bit of sun up here in winter and also in summer and autumn and so on. So that led to a kind of organization where bedrooms are downstairs around three courtyards, four courtyards, and the living spaces are all above in double height spaces and this very large glass roof that's also highly controlling of the light entering through it. So you can see here this glass roof and the four, there's a one, two, three, four courtyards. Um, it went up to the highest point it could, which is 10 meters up along the north wall and sloped down to about 80 meters here. And the kind of organization of the house is visible when you look at the elevation in that the, the living spaces are double height above and the bedrooms are all below. And this is where I was showing you that cloud of all year round sun. So what we wanted to do is ensure that if there was sun, we got sun into the house. So if you imagine that gets sun on a winter's day, but everywhere else doesn't on the lower levels. But this gives you the sense that you're connected to the environment and connected to when that, when that, that actual moment happens. The uh, house is all built from concrete, which kind of tempered the light, but also helps uh, temper the environment and make it keep it uh, cool in the summer, so it's all naturally ventilated. Um, and these are the, the double height living and dining spaces. And looking into the main courtyard that I showed you also where that cloud was, so we're a story up off the ground, 
looking into that main courtyard space in the double height living room. And then you go down a level and the atmosphere changes quite significantly. This is the bathroom looking into the main swimming pool. So there's the backland site, the house in the end, hidden away so nobody knows it's there apart from these immediate neighbors. So it's very, very private, um, but it kind of creates its own environment. This is a short film that we've been making and really what we're exploring is the different atmospheres that uh, exist in the house. This is shot in the winter, I think it was around November. Um, the facade kind of opens and closes, it's very inward looking, um, creates its own world, um, but there are all these sequences of spaces you go through, so he's now uh, in the master bedroom, bathroom we were just looking at, which is kind of dark and has a different feeling. Then upstairs you kind of really sense the changes in environment as the sun moves around the site and the weather changes. There's an awful lot of control of light within the house, so the glass roof has three different kinds of frit patterns and uh, different densities, and there are blinds that retract and opening windows that, that um, let the air in and light in. And the rooms were kind of designed for the light to track around, you could see it there, but not where you're actually sitting. So it's very much controlling activities in each room, including how the roof worked. And there's a stainless steel lined swimming pool, which again is connected to, viewed from the bedrooms and uh, viewed from upstairs, you can look down onto it. And this is from a basement space, you can look through underwater. So, having finished that house that took 10 years, just um, so Will knows, which uh, we then moved on to a project in Costa Rica. It was actually a very, very different task. It was the opposite task. So, this is a very hot, sunny, sunny, humid climate. And what you want to do is build a house that protects you from the sun and uh, allows you to live a kind of outdoor experience. So the house was for my father, who's a writer, and he had 16,000 books and a grand piano, and uh, he wanted to go there and write, basically. And he liked the, the, the sense of being outdoors. It's right on a black sand beach, a volcanic beach. And this was the site before we, before anything happened to it. There's an existing small house there. And when I first went, what I was kind of intrigued by was you know, trying to understand how people live there currently. So this was a house we went and visited of the guy who owned the local restaurant, and he would sit here and smoke his fags here and look out the window. But at the end of the day, I noticed he would close, close these windows, but they had no glass in them or anything in them. So it was a kind of psychological thing, but it showed you that all of this is a completely open structure, and environmentally, that, that's the kind of best way to live. So you have big overhangs and a very open, open facade. At the same time, everything was built in a kind of very ad hoc way. Nobody seemed to mind. They just used local materials, local tin, local wood, put things together, leave gaps to let air through. So I was quite intrigued by that as a starting point. So just looking at the kind of sun position on the, on the site, what we, we were hoping is that the canopy of the trees would provide sufficient shade, we wouldn't have to worry too much, but through this kind of analysis, we realized that wasn't quite the case. Um, so we were, you know, we wanted to find a site where within the site, there would kind of already be in a good starting position uh, by, by being protected from the trees, but maybe would need more to, to work to do with it. So we started looking at shelf state shading structures. This is actually using um, Ecotect a long time ago, where we wanted to shade that one square meter all year round and just understand what, how big the scale of shading structures was to make that possible. This is a similar exercise with a different plan. You can just see that the kind of edge of the shadow just skirts that plan, and that's the form that's generated. Um, the site itself, there's an existing house here, there's a neighboring house here, 
Abraham's here and this road that, that kinks here and then the sea is here and the jungle here. And we wanted to build a studio of about 100 square meters and uh, a bedroom, separate bedroom. And one part of the brief was that we weren't allowed to cut down any trees. So we had to find a space for that to fit, but also work environmentally. So we found that by uh, the form we generated eventually was actually this uh, self-shading form that was completely open to the sea here and completely open to the jungle there, solid on either side because that kind of tracked the sun path. But also it was kind of interesting how it also solved other problems for us in that we got privacy from neighbors here and privacy from neighbors here and a kind of view towards the entrance from the street where you came, come in, came into the house. So the house is lifted up off the ground to promote the breezes. The two buildings are separated quite a distance to allow the wind shadow to come over the front building into the back building. You get the views by being lifted up to the sea, into the jungle, and then cross ventilation through the building. So we had kind of uh, big glazed screens that open uh, and this kind of overhanging parallelogram that we developed. And it was all made from the local timbers. So this is a very heavy uh, timber used for the foundations called kacha that's so heavy it doesn't float. Um, and that was used for the foundations. And then laurel was used for the superstructure uh, which um, we needed in 10 meter lengths, which we found impossible to find in kind of lumber yards. So same time they, it was quite a complex form, although there's a kind of simplicity to it. And drawings were something that we found was very hard to communicate with the local builders. So we ended up producing models and literally saying, this is what I want you to build here, but a lot bigger. And I think it was quite an interesting moment because when that model appeared, them having looked at drawings for a few months, they suddenly relaxed and were able to, to kind of understand what they had to make. Um, so we built that model and then we built them bigger scale models of every single junction. And as you can start to see when you look through these, there's some quite complex junctions that are generated from that simple form. But the fact that each one of these existed and was coded in such a way that they could quite easily understand where it was in the building um, really made a big difference. So I think this is one of my favorites, I think eight-way eight -way junction in timber, which is quite hard to do. And you know, it was built very, very simply. So you dig a hole, you put some concrete in, you put these piles, the, the uh, kacha piles in the ground, and then you build the superstructure on top of that. And you know, this is four months in, I think, and I kind of love this photograph because there's just no damage on the ground. There's no machinery, there's no scaffolding, there's no diggers, there's no concrete mixing. It's just kind of people wandering around and climbing up things and sawing things and screwing things together. But it's kind of very nice to see this kind of simple way of approaching how to build something for the environment as well, because that garden remained exactly as it was. So this is it. Uh, lined as well, and the skin being put on, and the finished house. So that's the front studio space with the, the tin around the outside and these big overhanging balconies that you get front and back of each of the spaces. And that form was very, very carefully defined, that angle and this angle, to shade the glazing inside. So as I said, the space was uh, a library for my father, a working space, 16,000 books. So this structure became the bookshelves on either side. And the height was actually partly generated by the amount of books he needed to store in the two spaces. That's him working at the desk, looking out to the sea. And these glazed screens have glass louvers that you can open and close, you can slide the windows, you can open it up completely to the breeze from the sea coming through the house. 
And this is one of the kind of balconies that the overhang is very carefully controlled to stop the sun hitting any of this glass. The bedroom at the back is in a very different atmosphere looking towards the jungle. And it's a kind of smaller, lower paral paral parallelogram. And there it is kind of sitting amongst the trees. Um, I teach and I also run a unit at Studio in the Woods every year, which is an ongoing kind of one-to-one -one building program for architects and students and whoever wants to come, where we get, I think there's six different groups and we each get about 10 students and we spend three days building something and each group has a kind of very different approach and our approach is always to kind of go with very little with kind of an ambition of something we want to uh, find out about and we call it constructed analysis. So we go there, um, this site specifically, we went with two things, a kind of interest in this chalk escarpment here that we wanted to kind of somehow manifest in some way and some mirrors. So we had these mirrors we didn't know what we were going to do with them, but we thought there was something about light and the white of the chalk that we could somehow expose. So we start to set up these tripods, quite carefully position mirrors, and quite quickly discovered something we weren't expecting, is that a square mirror, if it's far enough away, will reflect the sun in a circle. So that was quite exciting, just as a discovery. So what we're actually doing is reflecting the sun on this chalk escarpment. And what we also found out is by very carefully measuring the position of the mirror and the position of the sun relative to that mirror to light that chalk escarpment, a form would start being generated that was specific to that particular moment in time when this experiment was happening. So it always happens in the summer over three days and we present on a Sunday. So we, we were mapping it or um, measuring it on the Friday, I think it was. On the Saturday, as is often our luck, it was cloudy all day. And when you're doing sun experiments, this is, can be really a problem. But because we'd taken enough data the day before, we were able to build on the Saturday with the measurements we had from the tools we developed from this original idea and then these we were building. So these are the forms being generated, which are a bit like kind of blinkers. They're essentially a way of stopping the sun hitting the mirror other than the time you want it to happen. And there were three different times we wanted it to happen. This is the sadly late, recently late Ted Cullinan, who was always a very great supporter of Student in the Woods and would come and visit and talk about everything. But these are our three solar mirror forms, which are all entirely different. They're all doing the exact same thing, but just at slightly different times. They're about two hours apart. So we were quite excited that that's what happens with just a kind of simple rule of doing the same thing, but at a different time. Here you can see the mirror inset and how these forms shade it and then allow the sun to hit at a certain time, and that would, that would bounce off the, the chalk. Um, what I'll show later, but what's really interesting, I think, about this is that you're starting to think about not the sun moving overhead, but you moving, as in we are rotating. And I think that's the kind of fundamental thing about understanding how what the sun is doing is it's, it's not moving, we're moving. And once you start to understand that, I think that generates all sorts of interesting relationships. Um, another house in London was on a very tricky backland site. Uh, there's a bungalow here built in the 60s, and it filled, pretty much filled the garden, a very large plane tree, a five-story building at the back, four-story buildings here, completely overshadowing this, this site. So, there's very little solar access to this site, but the desire was to create a house that would have a sense that 
it wasn't like that. You know, how can you completely transform that sense of being in a, a north-facing garden in London? So obviously we started looking at what the sun was doing, how overshadowed it was, and you start realizing it's very overshadowed and it's you know, quite a big problem. If you start breaking up the information again, you can start to really pick through it and see where, where maybe there are opportunities. So you start seeing slightly higher amounts of sun in these two places, away from the trees, away from these houses here. And as this goes up higher, you start to um, think of possibilities of, of a form that could be generated that might respond to that. So what, what we realized we were going to be doing was building the house in the, the shadow of the surrounding buildings and facing out to where there was potential for sun. So we found these three spaces as, oops, what have I done? Um, have I done anything? Uh, not yet, no, it shouldn't, no. Okay. But, well, you can play it, but I don't. Okay, but that, that we, we finished that. Can we just end that one? Yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah. So, uh, thank you. Um, yeah, so we're what we realize we're doing is going to build the house in the shadow and look out onto where there is light. So there are three places where there were light, lower down in the ground, we could have a garden. And we realized that if we went very high up in quite a specific place towards the back of the site, we could create an oculus that would bring light into the house. And this form is essentially generated through those three things, but also creating allowing for privacy between neighboring properties and views to be maintained. So we, didn't, we, did, we couldn't build something larger than, than this. Um, so the roof form, I just want to talk a bit about how that roof was built because I think it's interesting. It's generated from a, a certain process and then you've got to overcome that problem uh, of generating quite a complex 3D form. So we decided to build it in timber and we started exploring different ways of doing that with different uh, techniques and ended up with a, a glue lamb structure that um, was curving in three, every element is curving in three different directions because it's not symmetrical, the form itself. The house is uh, built behind these existing houses, so overshadowed by all of these in this garden. I'm just going to take you through the plans. Um, so you enter down the side here. This ground floor is a living space and kitchen and entrance, and that's a light well here, and then the main garden here. So you can see it's exactly mirroring that form I showed you in the analysis. And then as you go downstairs, there are two bedrooms on this floor, one larger bedroom overlooking this light well, smaller bedroom looking this light well, bathroom looking to this light well, and this other bathroom looking to this light well. And each light well has a skylight that also serves the floor, lower basement, um, which is a kind of yoga space, a gallery, and a swimming pool and a plant room. So the section is, this is the top of the neighboring buildings. There's the top of the oculus with the sun hitting that. And it goes down two floors underground as well. The basement construction was all top down. We found um, a Thames ring main 40 meters underground and they tried to stop the project. So we had to build the basement top down, which is essentially casting the slabs, digging out the earth, casting the next slab, digging out the earth, casting the next slab after you piled. But actually the good thing about that is you don't have so much temporary works and your neighbors don't really know what's going on is really helpful. Um, the roof then was in fact built in northern Italy in the Dolomites in this workshop. Uh, so this was quite an extraordinary moment having built all those models in the office to go and see the roof at one-to-one -one scale 
in a workshop. So it's basically built here and then taken apart. Um, each glue lamb beam is individual and curves in one direction like that, curves like that, and then curves a second, third way as well. Um, and somehow they put them all together, as you can see here. That's a drawing of one of the beams, so there's individual drawings for every single one. You can see this is a kind of supposed plan view, but it's showing all the twists and curves. That's a kind of elevation view, and that's the third view of that piece with all the dimensions. And what, what I was interested to find is that we had built a very accurate 3D model of the roof, which all of these drawings were generated from. And we'd always assumed it would be built in a kind of uh, CNC cutting way. It would be done using computer controlled methods. In fact, it turned out it was all done by hand using kind of quite old craft skills. And, but using, you can see on the ground there, one-to-one -one prints of the 3D model that were lofted. So using very old techniques to make these glue lamb beams. Um, slicing them up and gluing them together over formers. And then the pieces were craned into site in, I think, uh, eight sections. And they had to come over the, over the neighboring house and drop down to the back. Um, this is a camera fixed to the the crane. So each piece was would lower down into position and then they would put the, the joining pieces in afterwards. But again it's just seeing this eventually just drop into position with something so complex. Um, there's a, a, a timber beam on each side that spans front to back and then two, two concrete walls, upstanding walls that, that hold the roof. So it's all sitting on this ring essentially. We're gonna do it. Yeah, so it just fits. And then externally that was clad again in a kind of much more low tech boat building technique of cross timbers, like two by one softwood, um, to get this complex curvature. And then to do the copper on the outside, we helped the copper um, contractor a lot by providing him with one-to-one uh, -one, uh, printouts of each piece of, of, um, of the copper. So you can actually, we gave him every fifth piece that we printed out on our plotter, cut out, and then rolled up, and then they rolled them up on site, and then they could generate the next ones from that. But this was, again, a kind of, for them, a revelation, because they thought it was such a complex thing to do, and we showed them, well, actually, if you just unravel from the 3D model, which we did very quickly during a meeting, just using the Grasshopper script to unravel all of this, uh, they suddenly understood, actually, well, that's not as complex as we thought it would be. This is it being installed. So this is the roof from above, and then here you, you see the, the, the building in its new context, or the context it created, or the context it has been generated from. So an awful lot of architecture is talked about as being contextual, but often what that means is it's somehow mimicking what's around it. I think what's interesting here is this is something not mimicking what's around it, but it's totally generated from a contextual response to that site. This is a time lapse I did from upstairs just showing how, how the Oculus is so carefully positioned that it's just kind of allowing the, the, the shade to move around it and always get the sun into it. I can't remember exactly when this was shot, but um, obviously this changes all throughout the year. Um, but it's interesting to show how it does work. 
Um, so inside, um, that's the main living space from the garden, looking up to the oculus with a light that's always kind of changing as you look through it. Um, that's the kind of rare moment I had when the building's finished and the client hasn't moved in, which is usually about half an hour. Um, but it's kind of a very nice thing to be able to do, is just kind of take in what you spent the last 10 years of your life doing and experiencing it a bit. Um, that was half an hour later, roughly. But um, anyway, I think it's, I'm always surprised when I'm, I go there and when I look at these images, understanding what that site was like before we did this. So it was a very, I would say, pretty miserable place. And I, I would say this isn't a miserable place. Um, and, you know, as you kind of, even as you descend down through the house, you're surrounded by light. You're always looking at light. You're always looking out towards courtyards. This is the bedroom and the bathroom looking out towards the courtyard. And then you go down another story, you're actually nine meters underground, uh, the swimming pool and this uh, gallery living space. And um, that light is coming through, through one of those light wells. We've done these um, time lapses recently, again, to explore that a bit more. So filming the different places where light comes into the house. This is one of the light wells. Um, and down in the pool, again, as I said, you're nine meters underground, and this light is finding its way through these gaps between buildings, between trees, between what we've built, and our new building to generate what's happening here. To experience light in a basement makes, you know, makes that space a kind of space you want to inhabit, makes it useful, makes it enjoyable. I think some of these are over 24 hours, so you're getting kind of day and night. Some, some of them even have moonlight, I think. So this is looking up to the oculus, and obviously you become intensely aware of the weather, of cloud cover controlling what you're look, what's happening within it, what the sun's doing. It's constantly changing the atmosphere within the house, um, and one day it's doing something completely different to the next. And as it kind of gets dark, it reverses, and you look up to the sky, and I think you can see you can see the stars now. It's quite a mesmerizing thing to look up through a hole in a building, actually. You can spend a long time doing that. And this is just a drone shot from above, just starting to explain the context a bit more. So you can read the immediate context of these buildings all around it, overshadowing it. But you know, just beyond this is busy roads and noise and activity. And actually, you've been in this oasis that's kind of quite cut off from it. Um, this is where I live. Yeah. So I, I look down on this house. Part of the reason it kind of came into existence is obviously I knew about it, having lived in this building uh, on top on the top flat, looking down on that bungalow. Um, so I'm going to show you two more houses and then another project in China. I think um, this is a house in the Bahamas, and it's quite a different problem here in that this is. This incredibly expensive island, um, and I think the highest concentration of billionaires live or have houses here. But they've all chosen the kind of strangest site to do that because it's uh, the hurricane hits the island from that side and not from the other side. So this is very much hurricane country, and the old town of Dunmore is been here for 300 years, quite happily with timber houses, because it's totally protected from the hurricane. But my client wants to build 
is what has a bought a house here and wanted to extend it overlooking the hurricane facing what is an amazingly beautiful beach called the Pink Sand Beach, which is quite mesmerizing, but I think there are lots of problems with it. So there you see the other side of the island where it's all protected, and that's very much like that still today. Um, so we started doing some kind of studies of wind studies and forms and how you can generate a form that might be able to work with the wind um, to uh, work with the, the sand dunes, protect itself from the wind and be comfortable because actually it can be not, not just hurricanes but actually normally when you're there it can be quite windy and not that comfortable. And then looking at this is, this is a kind of copy, this is the house on the site, it's a copy of some of the local houses that's built in the kind of 80s by an American family. But it, it kind of mimics what the houses do, which is generally have big overhanging roofs, big outdoor spaces beyond, and then a kind of inner, inner sanctum there. So we, our brief was to refurbish that house, build a bedroom pavilion on the beach and a guest pavilion up on the, on the hill. And we, we wanted to kind of take that typology of these balconies, but kind of work with it more specifically to the site and what the sun was doing. Uh, south is here, and this is east and west to generate these kind of different outdoor spaces that react differently to the site. So that's the master plan of the existing house. We created a new garden that was protected from the wind, so on the kind of the hidden side from the wind, a pavilion bedroom on the beach and a tower on the roof, uh, on the hill. So this is a bedroom uh, with balcony terraces on three sides. This is facing the sea here and facing back that way. And you go down to the bathroom and dressing area here, which looks out to the, to the garden. And the whole building was built out of concrete, not surprisingly, because of the, uh, the hurricane. So there's actually no materials on the, on the island other than the sand. So we use the sand from the land where we dug the foundations and mixed that, cleaned it and mixed it in our concrete mix, trying to actually emulate the color of the, the sand on the beach. But it's not only, is it only it's concrete, but it's also solid concrete, no insulation, no other materials on the roof. So waterproof concrete everywhere, the whole thing, including the bathroom and the stairs. So it's basically concrete and glass, and that was the building. There was a bedroom tower up on the hill with a kind of similar geometries and balconies, peaking up with a kind of very different view, looking out in a different way. So these are models we made studying the form of the roof and the space itself and the, the, the geometry that the concrete could work with and the thicknesses we could work with. And we built a mock-up on the main island where the concrete contractor lived to test all the detailing and the actual concrete mix and how you do drips and how you do turn corners and so on. And started building. So it's kind of amazingly simple building method. You dig out the sand. You basically kind of just level it, but you don't compact it in any way. Um, and pretty much we poured concrete onto this. Um, this is the dune here, so this is actually the lower levels of the main pavilion. And the concrete mix that I talked about was kind of locally sourced to try and mimic this uh, color, the tower going up and uh, working on the beach. It's quite a nice sight place to be. So the... Uh, the finished structure was then, these are about 18 meter spans we're doing, big openings on either side of the bedroom. And then this hole allows kind of air from the sea through to the garden and these spaces here. So it's kind of hovering on the edge of the, of the beach that's so quite hidden from the beach. And you know, these, these kind of big overhanging roofs create these shaded, shaded spaces as well. And really, it's all about the view, which is a kind of an extraordinary view out to the beach and to the sea beyond. So we want to kind of create that framed view. As you come downstairs, this is the staircase down to the bathroom, the stair, the bath, the sink, 
everything, the structure is all made from concrete, that concrete. These are the pavilions. Um, in Sardinia, we are building, well, we're trying to get planning permission for a house. Um, this is on the Costa Smeralda, which is in kind of north of the, the island. It's a rather extraordinary landscape with these incredible rock formations, amazing water and color, texture. And our site is here with this beach overlooking these islands, which are famous islands, the Madalena Islands. Uh, and this is looking from another position. So it's quite rugged topography and quite uh, harsh, the kind of landscape in a sense. It's not kind of soft, it's very defensive. And um, the north of the island was, was kind of, a lot of it was bought by the Aga Khan in the 60s. He turned it into kind of holiday resort and hired all these quite amazing architects who built very beautiful buildings, very organic architecture that uh, we thought were very nice when we visited. And you know some of these incredible houses that are built like this that kind of have a solid rock and concrete and amazing openings. And our clients said, we don't want to do anything like those buildings because what we're trying to do now, there's been too much kind of mimicking of that architecture in a very bad way. And they want a kind of new, a new, I don't know whether it's aesthetic or a new approach so we start in a way I'd say we don't normally start, which is a kind of more trying to develop a kind of design schema for the site. So how could you work with the topography? How could you generate the kind of house you want to live in that's very much about being outside? And through kind of discussions, we realize actually what you want is not a lot of internal space, but an awful lot of external space. So the kind of unshaded parts of the external um, shaded terraces. And at the same time, very important criteria for the project was to have this west uh, sunset view to these islands. So the sun moves around the site and you want to look at the, the view. So this schema we developed was essentially kind of big walls of concrete, big roofs of concrete, big slabs of floor of concrete, generating shade around much smaller kind of glazed spaces that would be the kind of supposedly inhabited spaces, although I think this house is all about being outside. Um, and having developed that schema, we were able to put it into um, Galapagos, which is an evolutionary solver for a series of criteria we set for it. So some were them to do with not going over the boundary of our site. Some were to do with the overhangs. We knew the size we needed to generate because we'd done analysis of how deep the overhangs could be. Uh, some were to do with having a view to the west. Uh, so each room had to have a view to the west. So basically they're trying to find a position on this topography. You look at these numbers, these are zero to 24 every meter going up. So it's actually 24 meters from the bottom to the top of slope that we're working within and trying to arrange these spaces so that they can satisfy all these criteria. So that's a kind of optimized solution from that set of criteria that was generated. And obviously we then use that to help us inform the kind of next stages of design. So this is the the, um, this is the uh, view from the road at the top looking towards the house with the sea over here. Um, basically planes and walls and on, in this elevation there's no, there are no windows looking towards you. Uh, so it's all very, very much a hidden, hidden world. And then as you kind of come round the site and look from the uh, south, you see all the terraces and the layers. So you'd approach from up here. This is a car park, and you'd walk through, through into this kind of protected wind courtyard here with a pool, a living space here. Keep going down to another living space, another pool, and then under here are more bedrooms, kind of cascading down the hill. Each one of which is kind of private from each other by overlapping these kind of quite elemental planes. 
And that's the view from looking back from the sea. So the plans start the bedroom suite at the bottom, work up to more bedrooms as you go up the hill. The master bedroom suite here with this kind of very small bedroom and huge terrace. That's the shaded area, that's the terrace, and that's the bedroom. And then bathrooms kind of hidden in the hill behind. And then as you go up more living spaces, this was the entrance I talked about, the swimming pool, you go towards the sea there. So you, all the rooms are separated from each other. There's no corridors. And you go outside to get from one room to the, to the other. That's just an excerpt. Um, so this is a kind of view from uh, aerial view of uh, the, the project, which is now in for planning, and views we've generated um, of what it's like to experience it. So it's quite kind of elemental and, you know, in a sense, mimicking these kind of rocky outcrops that appear in the landscape. This is our house that actually kind of surprisingly disappears, you know, it's quite a large scale element, but from this view specifically, you, it kind of almost disappears, and as you get kind of closer into it, it becomes more enveloping. And the sunset, which is a kind of main criteria for these views, so. Um, in China, we have been doing some projects in Taiwan, actually, but through connections with the Taiwanese architect, they invited us to do this competition for a research and development headquarters for a mobile phone company, the third biggest mobile phone company in China. And we won that competition, and um, it's a very big project that is kind of very different way of working for us. So it's extremely fast, extremely kind of challenging, and what we're doing is basically being concept architects and then it's kind of taken away from us and they do what they're gonna to do to it. So we're constantly trying to stay on top of it with them. But what you get at the beginning is a kind of drawing like this that basically tells you roughly the rules of what you can do. So you look at this and you think, oh, so I can go 40 floors here, four floors here, 38 floors here, four floors here. I think this is 14 floors and so on, four floors here what the setbacks are, where you can put the building. So before you start, you can't do any of the kind of things we're used to doing, which is like working out where would you put a building on a site? How would it relate to the street? How would it relate to other buildings? What would the context inform it? You're actually just told, here's a rectangle. That's how high you can go. And now can you give us a design, please? So within those constraints, you have to kind of find a way of working. So we started by just kind of modeling the form that we couldn't have in a way and starting to understand if you start to break that down, what could you do? So we were quite interested in shifting these elements to slightly kind of self-shade the building to create ways of not having a fully exposed the elements uh, facade, to have kind of recesses that also could be shaded um, and thought that would be a kind of interesting starting point. So, again, this is showing pulling the elements apart and lifting them apart, and then um, the skin, the facade that would go on that. So, um, the facade rule was interesting. The client wanted a fully glazed building, but the local authority wanted it to be 30% uh, solid. So they were assuming a kind of more solid building with windows, but our client was insisted to find a way that it could be kind of read as fully glazed. And what, what's interesting again with that is it starts to give us opportunities to do something more interesting with, with it. So by stepping the facade in the same way we step the elevation and the plan, we are able to, um, sorry, we are able to have three different positions for the glazing. 
with the mullions in the same position so that we could have different depths in the facade. So you get these shaded parts, so a percentage of, of the facade is shaded. And as you look at it from different directions, it becomes more and more solid. So in some directions, it looks entirely solid, and it is technically fulfilling the 30% requirement. That's then the facade. You can see doing that with these different uh, steps within it on plan and the steps within it on the facade. The plan itself, we worked hard to get quite shallow floor plates to put the core in the middle. These are about 10 meter floor plates, so they get very good daylight all the way around these spaces. Um, and then you can see this facade stepping in and out and then the actual uh, glazing itself mimicking the same thing, so that kind of self-similarity happening. And then these are each component of the facade, each mullion, and all the different, different ways you could have front and middle, and front and back and so on of the facade. So these are some of our CGI's from the time. There was a low rise building, so they call this the low rise, which is 14 stories. This is 42 stories. So this is a research and development headquarters for the mobile phone company, and the lower building will be a kind of hotel and a retail and uh, various other uses, but it keeps changing kind of daily. They're not quite sure. So um, we worked then on the interiors and trying to kind of take this idea through of the kind of self-similarity and the layering of the facade within it and managed to get some spaces. I think halfway up the building, there's a three-story um, uh, triple height space all the way around. That's a kind of central meeting and activity space. And then, you know, the offices themselves, the floor plates have this sense of connection to the outside through these projecting bays that you have in each, in each structural bay. And the biggest surprise is actually being built. So that project went quiet for four years, and then January this year, I got a call saying, can you help us with the lighting? And I said, of what? And they said, well, we're building the tower. So I kind of insisted I went over there and managed to, been managing to work with them since then to kind of improve the kind of changes they've made. But it's quite a kind of leap in scale for us, so from doing houses to be doing a 42-story tower. But in China, a 42-story tower is kind of just what is built. It's completely normal, um, and you can't question that, unfortunately. But um, it's been very interesting to experience this. This is a mock-up, full-size mock-up of part of the facade. So I managed to go and inspect that and comment on it. And this is it. about two months ago. They got up to, I think, 14 stories high. Um, we make a lot of models in the office, so I'm just quickly going to show you uh, s a selection of them. We've been uh, cataloging them and photographing them recently because we want to kind of make a book, because I think they're very important. So even though we work quite a lot digitally, we also work very much making things and understanding materials and understanding light by making things. This is a chapel in Taiwan called the One Line Sky Chapel that has a kind of gap between these two cantilevered concrete walls that lets light in, so a single line of light running through it. And you make, you know, accidental models. These are two models of garden house roof stuck together. Um, these are some early models for the Bahamas project. This is actually a temporary... Uh, space in Taiwan made out of containers. So each one of these bricks, as I call them, is a container. And it spanned, I think, 130 meters. Um, sadly, didn't get built. I would have liked seeing that. They're all quite different, the models. They're all using different techniques. We don't have a kind of set way of working. It's often to do with who's working on the model, but they're all exploring ideas that are kind of fundamental to, 
to what we're looking at. This is a very early model of the, the, the Oppo Tower. Um, but there's something very different about a physical model compared to working in a computer. It's very, very fundamental. I'm just going to end with a quick... Uh, we return to the kind of idea of... Uh, so we do studio in the woods every year. We always work with something to do with sunlight. But we return this year to the idea of the mirrors and um, the, this was on, um, this is in the wire forest. So we kind of reversed what we did before and um, instead of building a structure where the mirror is, we built a structure where the mirror reflects onto the uh, underside of a dark, the darkest space we could find in the forest. So the kind of process in Studio in the Woods is you, you meet your students, you start to walk around the forest, you find a site. So we, we kind of knew we were looking for a dark space to bring light into. So we walked around with the mirrors and we did various tests and tried to find the best place for it to happen. Um, and it kind of starts off very kind of low tech. You're just holding it trying to work out what it's doing, you're realizing that actually you need to find a clearing for the sun to come in, and then you can point the mirror to the dark space. And there's obviously a lot of conversation and kind of thinking through, but what we're trying to do is not, in all these projects, we're not designing, so we're, we're allowing the kind of solution to emerge through this constructed analysis. So by, by just physically doing and not making models and not drawing, so you start to see kind of slightly more sophisticated tripods being built and ways of holding the mirrors and you can start to see reflection there. This is the tree space we found. Um, and I kind of like this evolution of the, the tool, which is this, how precisely you could hold a mirror in, in space because that became kind of really critical. And these kind of very low tech ones that just string and whatever we could find to make it work. Um, and what we're building is actually the path of the sun's movement, sorry, not the sun's movement, our movement reflected on this timber. Um, so we're building a structure that showed exactly where that was happening. In fact, we built, I think, four structures with four different mirrors coming from different positions around the tree. And each one of them did counterintuitively completely different things and went off in different directions. We couldn't even understand why it went that way rather than that way. So part of it is kind of discovery. Part of it is the physical act of making stuff, which is enjoyable in timber. It's always in timber. Um, but really, I think for us, that's the least important aspect of it. So this is one of the structures with this kind of line that is where the, the sun tracks along. And then of course the sun didn't come out on the day we want to show it, so we had to go back and film this happening. So this is a time lapse of a mirror, I think about 90 meters away in a clearing, held still in a position, and as we rotated, the sun reflecting off the mirror onto this plank that we'd built that exactly mimicked that path. And I'm going to end there. Thank you. My favorite project, I think probably, yeah, I mean, 
I kind of, I don't really look back that much. I'm trying to look forward, but I'd say a very satisfying one is Kazakike because I think it's so kind of straightforward but demonstrates all the things we're looking at in a very simple way. So it demonstrates the kind of understanding of that specific place, not only in the form it was generated, but the materials used, the way it was built, the relationship with the context. So, um, yeah, I'd probably say that. Um, for some reason, they're saying it might be in Sweden next year. That doesn't mean it's a bad thing. I'm just saying it might be in Sweden. Yeah. It's usually around the middle of July. Yeah. And I don't know if you know Piers Taylor, Invisible Studio. If you go on his website, you can usually find out. But we don't announce it till about February, March. Sometimes it doesn't happen, but we hope it will. It's all done in-house, yeah. So it's interesting because the very first project we did, Lighthouse, we worked with Arup, and they were doing all the computational radiance work, and it was extremely frustrating because we'd send it off and we'd wait forever and it would come back. So we had to kind of find a way to do it ourselves, which I think now is commonplace. It's something you can do relatively straightforwardly, and I think that's really important for us is to be able to do that ourselves, yeah. Yeah. Um, and of course, one of the main you know, aspects of this in terms of the setting is its contextual changes. Mm. Um, are there difficulties in dealing with the contextual issues? On the one hand, you're trying to make it very sort of specific to uh, the location and, and building it around it. Yeah. And you seem to have some concerns with that as well. I don't know how I could deal with that in the sense that if, I don't know, the building in front of Garden House was knocked down or made taller, but. Um, it definitely does happen. It happened on another project of ours in Percy Street, where I think it's gone up. Three different buildings have added one or two stories. Um, I'm not sure. Yeah, I'm not sure how I overcome that, because it is so specific. Um, I mean, what I find interesting with the urban projects is that they are so much more determined by what's around them. So my worst project is a kind of greenfield site with nothing because you've got no starting point and no constraints. So those constraints are really important. But you know, even within the, the landscapes we work in, trees grow and those, so some things you can anticipate a bit. The form of that tree actually mimics, sorry, the form of the roof mimics the root tree that will grow. It's had to be replaced, a smaller one, but it will grow the bigger scale, so some things we've kind of allowed to happen in a way. Thank you very much. Thanks, Will.